Okay, if everybody could please be quiet. Thanks for coming, everybody. My name is David Reese. Uh, I asked if I could just introduce myself. Uh, David Reese um, was born in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, not too far from here. And um, David Reese uh, used to be a political cartoonist, and he used a lot of clip art. But David Reese doesn't do that anymore. Now David Reese has an artisanal pencil sharpening business. And um, he has a new book, celebrating his business and sharing his knowledge with all of you folks. And the book is here. It's called How to Sharpen Pencils. This is a how-to guide on pencil sharpening techniques. It has 18 chapters of different ways of pointing a pencil. <laughs> Uh, and it's filled with uh, illustrations and photographs and technical information and things to make you smile and things to make you think. Uh, so would you please welcome David Reese. Hi guys, uh, thanks for coming, I'm David. Um, I'm on a nationwide pencil sharpening tour. And um, there are a couple things I'd like to say, just because there's been a lot of confusion about what exactly is going on with me and my life right now. Uh, a lot of the liberal lamestream media has said that this is all just a huge joke or a prank, but it's not. I literally have an artisanal pencil sharpening business. This is my travel kit. It contains everything I need to sharpen a pencil. It has 12 pencil sharpeners, sandpaper, rags, rubber tubing to protect the pencil points, certificates, labels, and uh, you can buy everything you need to properly sharpen a pencil for less than a thousand dollars, so don't worry about it. <laughs> what I'd like to do this evening is share with you some of the more advanced and esoteric pencil sharpening techniques that I've mastered since I started my business, artisanalpencilsharpening.com. So I'm going to demonstrate some techniques using human volunteers. And then I would love to entertain some questions that you have. I'll answer any question about pencils, pencil sharpeners, pencil sharpening techniques, or starting your own pencil sharpening business. And then at the conclusion of my event, I'll be happy to sign any book that you have paid for. And uh, I'll also be happy to sell you a print that promotes my business. And then I'll also be happy to sharpen pencils for the reduced rate of $10 per pencil. Uh, online, it costs $15. So this represents a substantial savings for those of you who are uh, penny, penny wise, let's say, and maybe a bit pound foolish. Um, yeah, without any further ado, I think I'd like to call up some volunteers. Now, one of the chapters in my book, uh, the 14th chapter, was a lot of fun to write, and it's a lot of fun to talk about on stage. Chapter 14 is called... Sharpening pencils for children. Um, however, I don't think there are any actual children in the audience. So instead of using actual children, why don't we use the two youngest audience members? Is there anyone here who is 25 years or younger? Raise your hand. Raise it high. You have nothing. You should. If I was that, I'd, my hand would be fucking scraping the roof. 25 years or younger. There's only two of you. It's perfect. You two gentlemen, come on up on stage. <laughs> Round of applause for the children. <laughs> What's your name? Jack. Jack and David. It's nice to meet you. What's your name? Chris. Chris and David. It's nice to meet you. So Jack and Chris will be performing as school children. <laughs> now we need someone else to perform as the artisanal pencil sharpener. <laughs> and for this, we need the oldest member of the audience. Now, I've learned the hard way not to just point out people and be like, come on up here, sir. You look really old. Is there anyone here who's 50 years old or older? Raise your hand. 55 or older? 51 or older? It's you, ma'am. Come on up. <laughs> Round of applause. I'm David. What's your name? Do you mind standing over here? Uh, now, one thing you've noticed about me is that I'm wearing a black apron. Why am I doing this? Because I'm an artisan. 
<laughs> this helps me establish dominance and authority over you people. <laughs> you would follow me anywhere. Now, you haven't earned the black apron yet, because you're just new to this, but we have a starter apron for you. You're supposed to like it. Someday you'll earn the black apron, but for now you wear the novice apron. <laughs> exactly. And you know how to tie that, of course. Okay. <laughs> I forgot your name. Sue. It is so simple. Simple Sue. Simple Sue from Richmond, Virginia. Um, simple Sue. You <laughs> this is a how-to manual. And what that means is the proof is in the pudding, which is to say that you are going to follow my instructions as I read them aloud to the letter, assuming nothing and doing nothing until I tell you to do so. Right. And if the book functions as intended, you will sharpen a pencil for the delight of these school children. Does that make sense? Okay. The first thing you need is just a regular yellow number two pencil. You can examine the pencil. It's not a trick pencil. It's just a regular number two Dixon Ticonderoga pencil. Yes. You'll just hold it in your hands, arms at your side, rest position. <laughs> guys ready? You should stand closer to the edge of the stage. Good, you know what? Good instincts. <laughs> Simple Sue, you are hereby known as Safety Sue. <laughs> this is going to make this experience especially poignant and emotionally fraught. Are you ready? Chapter 14, Sharpening Pencils for Children. Children are fascinated by pencils, even if they don't understand them. <laughs> Opening the doors of your practice to young people allows you to demystify the work of a pencil sharpener. It also teaches children to value integrity, craftsmanship, and capitalist ingenuity. <laughs> Parents or teachers planning their next birthday party or school field trip would do well to remember the artisanal pencil sharpener. A rewarding time can be had by all, provided the children are not unruly and bring their own sandwiches. Step one, child-proofing your workplace. From the moment they cross the threshold of your workplace until the moment they leave, children's safety is your responsibility. Before their arrival, take a few minutes to make sure your workplace is child-appropriate. Clear the area of pocket knives, box cutters, stray piles of pencil shavings, alcohol, and other industrial lubricants. <laughs> and any pencil sharpener worth more than $2. <laughs> if parents register concern about their kids visiting a professional pencil sharpener, you can put them at ease with a curt reminder that a pencil's lead doesn't contain actual lead, and their children may eat pencil shavings all day without fear of lead poisoning. <laughs> if their children attend an expensive New England private school, a casual mention of Henry David Thoreau's career as a pencil manufacturer should lend the visit a patina of Yankee exclusivity that most parents will find irresistible. <laughs> if their children attend an underfunded public school, a casual mention of free pencils should suffice. <laughs> if their children are homeschooled, an extended monologue about the Federal Reserve, the Zionist evolution conspiracy, and or the vaccination mafia will likely result in a dinner invitation. <laughs> Step two, explaining your practice. <laughs> Once the children are assembled before your workbench, introduce yourself and explain that you will be sharpening a pencil for them in real time. You should reassure them that there will be no trickery involved in the events that follow, that you will point the pencil honestly without the aid of computer-generated imagery, distracting sound effects, or market-tested emotional manipulation. <laughs> These savvy consumers will appreciate your pledge of hard scrabble authenticity. Next, show the children the pencil sharpener you have chosen for this very special job. When working with children, I use a little piggy sharpener with a removable snout covering the entry hole. You sharpen the pencil by sticking it in the pig's nose. The pig's digestive system has been replaced by a sharpening blade. <laughs> My experience shows that children respond well to this whimsical device, often losing themselves in an ecstasy of unguarded giggles for five to six seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Often losing themselves in an ecstasy of unbearable giggles for five to six seconds. <laughs> Often losing themselves in an ecstasy of unguarded giggles.
for five to six seconds. <laughs> okay. Step three, sticking a pencil up your nose. If you sense the children's attention lagging, stick a pencil up your nose. Which Dealer's choice. <laughs> If they seem bewildered, you can explain your behavior by reference to the sharpener in hand. Recall that this piggy sharpener works by inserting the pencil into its nose. I have done the same with my own nose. I'm being silly. React appropriately. <laughs> Say this to the children while sticking the pencil up your nose. Um, recall that this piggy sharpener works by inserting the pencil into its nose. I've done the same. So if you're not hungry, you're amused. <laughs> Charles Dickens, where every child is starving to death. <laughs> Step four, upping the ante. <laughs> Step four, up in the ante. <laughs> if the children are too young to appreciate the goodwill and humor you're expending on their behalf, try smiling even wider, leaning slightly forward, while pushing the pencil farther up your nose. <laughs> if you feel dizzy, you push too far. No, I'm sorry, pushing the pencil farther up your nose. <laughs> These subtle actions should engage their attention more fully and increase the level of enthusiasm in the room. <laughs> You feeling it? Yeah. <laughs> now that you have earned the children's undivided attention, remind them that you are an adult and enjoy certain liberties they haven't earned. Which is why it's appropriate for you to push a pencil up your nose while the same behavior on their part would be irresponsible and dangerous. If there are adult chaperones in the room, shout this. Kids, you shouldn't stick pencils in your nose. Kids, you shouldn't your nose. Because you could hemorrhage blood, <laughs> damage your brain, or blind yourself. Remove the pencil from your nose, wipe it clean, and set it aside. Step five, playtime is over. <laughs> Once you have charmed the children with your nasal whimsy, <laughs> proceed to sharpen the pencil according to the technique outlined in Chapter 5. Now, we didn't review Chapter 5, but Chapter 5 concerns the use of a single blade pocket sharpener. And you guys all remember this from your childhood. This is the pencil sharpener that, that points the pencil. You stick it in and you rotate the pencil shaft against the blade, of course, right? And it produces this lovely, iconic ribbon of shavings, right? Just scalloped edges. And this is sometimes known as the apple peel effect or Milady's ruffled skirt abandoned on the floor in the throes of our lovemaking. It's <laughs> another name for this. So what you're going to do is just simply use this piggy pencil sharpener as a single blade pocket sharpener. Remember to smile enthusiastically and often and address the children by name. Now, if you've forgotten the children's name, Table 14.1 actually does have common names of American school children. <laughs> and if their name is on that list, there's also uh, Table 14.2, uncommon names of American school children. Jack. Jack. And? Yeah. Let's go with our real names here. Chris. Chris. Those names aren't on my list. Not real names. <laughs> If your little admirers break your concentration during the sharpening process with questions, remind them that sharpening a pencil, while silly and fun, is also a somber practice that demands silence from practitioner and patrons alike. Instruct them to hold their questions until the pencil is finished, at which time they will be answered in order of oldest child to youngest child. Now, you're wondering, why is this? Well, as older children generally ask more sophisticated questions, their younger peers will likely find that your answers satisfy their own unanswered questions, minimizing redundancy in the exchange. It's all about having a good time. <laughs> step six. This is the best step, guys. You ready? This is the sound of a woman who has just seen the inside of my travel pencil shirt. <laughs> Step 
Step six. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a bag of pencil shavings. <laughs> Nothing captures a child's imagination like the sight of pencil shavings being deposited in a plastic bag. <laughs> Do not deny your audience the thrill of this final flourish in the sharpening practice. If they seem confused by the shavings bag or fail to recognize its significance, you can encourage their appreciation by announcing, I have placed the shavings of the pencil I just sharpened for you in this bag. I have placed the shavings of the pencil that I have just sharpened in this bag. The sharpening process is concluded. The sharpening process is concluded. And our time together has come to an end. And our time together has come to an end. If the children's visit was part of a school field trip, their teacher may be reluctant to allow them back on the school bus with freshly sharpened pencils. In this case, the tiny bag of shavings will suffice as a keepsake and a sentimental comfort in the twilight years of their old age. <laughs> Tell them this. These pencil shavings will serve as a keepsake in the twilight years of your old age. <laughs> so you can hand them now to the children. Are they going to share these? I'll have to figure that out. <laughs> Thank the children for sharing in your handiwork and escort them to the door, wishing them a happy day. <laughs> Before they leave your workshop, emphasize to the children not to make a habit of accepting bags of unusual substances from strange adults. You got it? <laughs> Round of applause for our children. <laughs> What's your name? Jack. Jack, sorry. Jack, I have a question for you. As a child, what for you was the most exciting part of that sharpening process? The sharpening. When she sharpened the pencil? Yes, that's interesting. I ask every child on this tour what they say. You're the first person to say that, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Okay. Uh, let's do a, a selection from another chapter involving volunteers. This is a chapter of novelty pencil sharpening techniques. These are pencil sharpening techniques when you just want to kick back and have a good time with a drink and some friends. You're done sharpening pencils for money. Now you just want to sharpen pencils for fun. Okay? So this is going to require some super fun individuals who are really dynamic and really enthusiastic and just want to have a good time learning something new and making friends along the way. So, can I please have a female volunteer come up on stage? Whoever made that squeaking sound. <laughs> <laughs> centuries, yet it's only recently that pencil sharpeners have become so familiar as to lose the shock of the new. For certain adrenaline junkies, this familiarity means a constant search for new, more radical ways of sharpening a pencil. Although one could criticize such thrill seekers for not being content with the novelty of a well-hewn pencil that stands for history in our age of automation and disposability, it's perhaps more rewarding to join in the hunt. 
To that end, I present here a few novelty sharpening techniques, some old and some new that will engage both craftsmen and audience. Technique number one, sharpening a pencil behind your back. Don't start. <laughs> Don't start with me, Carol. <laughs> this technique is said to have been inspired by Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> famous guitarist who reveled in outlandish and theatrical flourishes. One of Hendrix's signature gestures, of course, was to play his guitar behind his head. Some argue Jimi Hendrix had to resort to playing the guitar behind his head in order to distract people from the fact that he was a mediocre musician. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix was, in fact, one of the top 500 guitar players of the 1960s. <laughs> his moments of behind-the-back exuberance were actually a celebration of his talent as well as a challenge to his audience. If you think I'm not very good at playing guitar, how do you explain the fact that I'm currently doing so behind my head while dressed like a gypsy? <laughs> if you don't the answer, just enjoy another of my interminable rock and roll guitar solos. <laughs> One of the most difficult things about playing a guitar behind one's head is that it's impossible to see the strings, frets, and buttons of the instrument while doing so. The guitar teacher who begins his first lesson with, put this Les Paul behind your head, is not to be trusted as the technique requires a long established comfort and familiarity with the instrument. The same is true of sharpening pencils. That's why I don't recommend this novelty technique for anyone with fewer than 200 hours of sharpening experience under his or her belt. I've got it. You've got it? I knew you did. <laughs> Insert the pencil into the sharpener. <laughs> okay. Raise your arms over and behind your head. Over and behind your head. Don't be alarmed if you can no longer see the pencil and sharpener. This is because they are behind you. Sharpen as usual, making sure the shavings don't fall inside the back of your shirt. <laughs> To the casual onlooker, of course, it looks like you're simply stretching your arms or adjusting your shirt collar. <laughs> but the small, steady sound of a pencil being sharpened will complicate their theory and drive them to distraction. It's not yet, Carol. We're not safe. <laughs> drive them to distraction. Where is that sound coming from? Is somebody sharpening a pencil in here? All I see is a lady stretching her arms, or maybe adjusting her collar. Now is the time to turn around and reveal your behind-the-head handiwork to the bewildered public. A moment's glance and they will understand everything. This is too chaotic. We have to get off the stage. Round of applause for, for Carol. sharpening that pencil, but I wasn't paid to sharpen it, so it must be destroyed. <laughs> I don't know. I think she dismissed me. All right. Uh, do I have time for one more novelty technique? Sure. All right. And then we'll do Q&A. Uh, let's have a male volunteer come on up here. Who's a man in this audience that likes to have fun? Yeah, come on up. Round of applause. Right. What's your name? I'm David. Yeah, man. It's nice I to meet you earlier. You know that. This is like a formality. That has a theatrical element of the unknown. You guys, it's my Uncle Pete. <laughs> with your teeth. <laughs> also inspired by Jimi Hendrix, 
This is a more dangerous technique that calls for focus and discipline beyond that of the behind the head move. When using this technique, take the precautions necessary to ensure that the sharpener won't accidentally slip out of your teeth and down your throat. Indeed, it's a testament to Hendricks' own meticulous preparation and discipline that in all his years of playing guitars with his teeth, he never accidentally swallowed one. <laughs> Place the pencil sharpener between your teeth, biting down on it to ensure its stability while pressing against it with your tongue to keep it from slipping back into your mouth. <laughs> Now, Pete has done something that their volunteers rarely do. <laughs> Make sure the shaving slit of the sharpener faces away from the mouth. <laughs> so that shavings do not fall inward onto your tongue, as this could lead to panic and the accidental dislodge of the sharpener, leading in turn to choke and death. <laughs> Sharpen as usual. <laughs> gestural profile of this activity is quite similar to that of brushing one's teeth, <laughs> which suggests a further escalation of whimsy. If you share a bathroom with a loved one, you can stand in front of the mirror sharpening a pencil in your mouth at the time you would otherwise be brushing your teeth. When your partner enters the bathroom, he or she will likely say, Oh, how sweet, you're brushing your teeth, I love you. <laughs> at which time you can turn around, remove the pencil sharpener from your mouth, say, all I can say is I'm glad you're not my dentist. All I can say is I'm glad you're not my dentist. Or pass the Colgate for my pencil. Or pass the Colgate for my pencil. <laughs> After you share a laugh over the simple mistake, make love and ejaculate with maximum <laughs> techniques of starting your own pencil sharpening business. Go ahead, try to stump me. You think it's a joke? Ask me a question about pencils, see what the fuck happens. <laughs> this begins now. Raise your hand. Yes. If I start a pencil sharpening business, am I guaranteed to get a girlfriend? A uh, gentleman asked a question. If I start a pencil sharpening business, am I guaranteed to get a girlfriend? Yes, you are. <laughs> Next question. Yes, man, with glasses. How many hours a week can one expect to have to work with a pencil sharpening business? It depends on the volume of business. So, for instance, when I first started, I was pretty busy because there was a lot of media attention about it. And then I hit a slump, and then the holidays came up, and there was a, a spike in activity so much so that I actually raised my, my base rate. And now that I've been on tour and I've had media attention, I'm actually kind of anticipating slash looking forward to slash dreading returning home where I have over 60 orders backed up. I can do about four pencils an hour, <laughs> so you can tell that I've probably been to work ahead of me. So it depends on your rates and the care and the, and the time that you put into your pencils. Yes, sir? Uh, how do you restore an eraser that's hardened? I have no interest in erasers. <laughs> <laughs> if I start my own pencil sharpening business, am I required to pay you for franchise rights? No, of course not. The whole point of this book is to share my knowledge with everybody and to empower people to sharpen their own pencils and to really celebrate and rediscover the pleasures not only of number two pencils, which I contend are a vastly underrated engineered device here, here. whose elegance and simplicity rivals anything Steve Jobs has ever come up with. <laughs> and also to empower people to just enjoy the different ways there are to put a point on a pencil, all the different techniques outlined in my book. The whole point of this book is to get some competition in this game that I invented. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Tim Kamarok is an American manufactured pencil. Do you have any thoughts or opinions about the Chinese import pencil? <laughs> uh, the uh, customer has said, Dixon Ticonderoga is an American manufactured pencil. Do you have any thoughts on Chinese imports? <laughs> Ma'am, I'm not a sadist, but I do enjoy busting people's bubbles when it comes to the particulars of international pencil manufacturing. 
This is a box of Dixon Ticonderogas, a formerly proud American brand. And you will notice on the back of this box, it says that these pencils were made in Mexico. <gasps> Dixon Ticonderogas, the world's best pencil, are no longer made in America. They're made either in Mexico or China. If you want an American-made yellow number two pencil, you should use the brand that I just had eight boxes of shipped to my house, which is General Semi-Hex number two pencil manufactured in Jersey City, New Jersey. Yeah. One of two American-made number two pencils. Next question. Yes, sir. Do you have any feelings about mechanical pencils? Oh, good question. Do I have any feelings about mechanical pencils? As a matter of fact, I devote an entire chapter of my book to mechanical pencils because I anticipated this question, and it's a short chapter, so I'll read it in its entirety. Chapter 11, a few words about mechanical pencils. Mechanical pencils are bullshit. <laughs> Next question. Yes, sir, plaid shirt. Uh, do you have a favorite method of sharpening pencils? My favorite method of sharpening pencils is whatever satisfies the client. And I move in my own particular preferences among the many, many uh, among the many techniques that I practice and have perfected and are outlined in my books. So some days I like to use a really nice double bar hand crank sharpener. Other days I like to use a double hold multi-stage pocket sharpener. Other days I like to just use a box cutter or a pocket knife. So for me, I don't really have a favorite technique. They all offer their own pleasures and their own anxieties, which is another thing to keep in mind. Yes? How do you come up with new techniques? How do you come up with new techniques? Well, it helps to be a creative genius. <laughs> uh, and it helps to be fascinated with the unknown horizons, heretofore unexplored. Which is why, as my book goes along, the techniques get uh, more and more advanced and esoteric. Chapter 18, the final chapter, is how to sharpen a pencil with your mind. And when you're ready to do that, the book is ready for you. Next question. Uh, yes, sir. Well, two burly reader men. Let's start with the one in the back. Uh, yeah, dealing with such sharp objects, uh, what kind of dangers uh, are involved? Well, pencils are sharp, and on this tour, of course, I've had many people come up and show me their pencil wound that they sustained as a child, and Timmy stab them with a pencil in the palm, and they ask me, oh, is this lead going to poison my whole body? Am I dying slowly, like every day a step closer to the grave? No. Pencil leads have never had lead in them, guys. It's always just graphite and clay. You can stab yourself in a pencil, it's fine. <laughs> uh, other injuries, uh, actually, ironically, the only time I really sustained a serious injury in my pencil sharpening business is, was in the research and development phase when I was slicing lengths of rubber tubing to figure out how to fit them over the pencil point. And instead of using a box cutter, I used a dull pair of scissors and I accidentally sliced into my interdigital fold. <laughs> yes. Um, are there different techniques you recommend for different types of lead breaks? Or different so types of what? Lead breaks, so when you're writing in the... Oh, I only deal with number two pencils. Or the graphite. Um, Techniques of sharpening the pencil. So if you're writing in the lead breaks, is there? A oh, if the lead breaks, I thought you said if the, I thought you said lead grades. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. if the lead breaks, what do you do to minimize your losses and keep moving forward? This stuff is covered in my book. It depends on the type of breakage and it depends on the type of tool that you want to use. So, for instance, if lead breaks because the pencil has been over sharpened. Sometimes this is caused by what, uh, what I call an irregular pin tip. You know this if you use a pocket sharpener and the pencil comes out and it's really sharp. You put it on the page and the whole tip shatters. And the way graphite is structured, it always shatters irregularly. So you kind of have to start from scratch. Sometimes it's easiest to just keep a piece of fine grid sandpaper on hand and you can just shave away the irregularities and just keep going without having to retool the entire pencil point. So that's easy. Uh, leaning against the bar. Um, do you have any uh, recommendations uh, on ways to display pencils that have been uh, creatively sharpened? Ways to display pencils that have been creatively sharpened? <laughs> well, if you order a pencil through my website, it is shipped in a shatterproof plastic display tube uh, that's actually quite handsome. And I also bag and return your shavings along with the pencil. The pencil and the shavings are labeled according to uh, sharpening date and sharpness, and I initial everything. And you also get a certificate. I have had people who have framed the entire suite of objects in like a nice deep box frame, either as a gift or as a... Oh. 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 <laughs> okay, we're going to start over, guys. <laughs> David Reese was born in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, 
So, yeah, that's how you display it. You, you buy it from me and I send you a display too. Do I even need this? What if you guys are like, yeah, actually I haven't heard a word you've said. We thought it was just kabuki. The, world, the world's least dramatic kabuki theater. Uh, who else has a question? Yes, ma'am. What is your favorite part of the pencil, the wood or the lead? Whoa. You know what? Namaste on that. Namaste. I'm going to sideways namaste. Uh, I've never been asked that question. What is my favorite part of the pencil, the wood or the lead? I don't play favorites. I'm not a Sophie's Choice kind of guy. You know, I love them all. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pick one, you know. They both have their endearing qualities, and depending on the quality of the pencil, depending on the age of the pencil, there might be some specimens in which the wood is especially fine and extraordinary. Like, uh, I recently got a gift of 100-year-old Dixons when they were made in America, and it was beautiful red cedar. I mean, you don't see wood of that quality in a contemporary pencil, certainly not in a contemporary Dixon Ticonderoga. And uh, when you would sharpen these things, this, the... The shavings were like salmon colored and extremely fragrant, just beautiful wood. And so in that case, for instance, I found the wood more remarkable than the graphite. So, yeah. Yes? How do you feel about all graphite pencils? I don't like that. That's bullshit. <laughs> all graphite pencils, that's just like a novelty item. You know, it's like, what if we built, you know what it's like? You know that museum in Paris called the Pompidou Center? Yeah. Where they're like, let's build a building inside out. So all the ugly bullshit, like the pipes are on the outside. It's like, why do that? Dumb. That's how I feel about all graphite pencils. Yes, sir. Is there any truth to what I've heard over the years that Lee Corso, ESPN football analyst, is a principal or an employee of Dixon Ticonderoga? Uh, I know nothing about sports or ESPN, and I have no interest in it, and I'm offended that I look like the type of man who would be able to answer the question. Next question. Uh, the film Natural Born Killers uh, had a scene in it where a person was brutally murdered with a sharp pencil. It was so shocking that it had to be deleted from the movie. You can see it in the director's cut. Oliver Stone talks about that and says that the pencil was just frighteningly sharp. So do you, do you know anything about the lore behind that Hollywood legend about a pencil murder? Natural Born Killers is honestly one of the dumbest movies I've ever seen. Anybody who bothers to watch it on DVD and learn anything about its production, its narrative, or its director should be corralled at a great distance from the rest of society. Uh, yes, sir, with the glasses. Uh, sort of related to that question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Do you have some favorite appearances of the pencil in popular culture? Oh, you know what? That's a great question. Favorite appearances of pencils in pop culture? Well, I can name two. One is contemporary and one is, one is uh, from my childhood. There was a... When I was thinking back in researching this book and I was thinking back to pencils and the iconography of pencils and why it was so powerful to me and to so many other people, I thought of two things from my childhood. The first was that one of the first images I ever remember my dad drawing for me, my dad was not like an artist, but he, he doodled sometimes, was, this is very Richard scary esque he drew a car that was a pencil. He drew me a little pencil car. And I remember my mind just being blown. <laughs> Simultaneously, it's a car and a pencil. I mean, that's pretty heavy. Uh, the other thing was a great book that I got once called The Non-Pointless Pencil Book, which was made by an illustrator. It has no words. It's just illustrations of pencils tied in knots, uh, pencils with two eraser. I mean, just like crazy, whimsical uh, imagery that plays with the iconography of pencils. And both of those had a big impact on me. These days, I think that the email or the images that I'm forwarded most often are those by the pencil sculptor Dalton Getty, who lives in New England. You've probably seen this is a guy who uses uh, hairpins and razors to sculpt uh, like hammers and al alphabet letters out of the lead of pencils. It's kind of a novelty act as far as I'm concerned. That's not really where I see my business going. <laughs> but as a fellow pencil enthusiast, I respect his patience and his craftsmanship. So those are some ideas that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, and yet you, sir. Can you speak a little bit more to the uh, graphite core? Because I noticed even in my number two pencils, 
I get a very different line from two different number number two pieces. Are they sharpened? Uh, no. What goes? What What is the composition of the core that would make the difference in? Right, so I told you folks that a pencil's lead doesn't contain lead and it's never contained lead. This is what happened in and around 1565 in England. They discovered the world's first and still largest deposit of naturally occurring graphite. Shepherds discovered it and they started using the graphite to mark their sheep. These guys were such idiots. They thought it was lead, so they started calling it lead and, the, and they never shook the name. From then on, as this graphite, which was so soft and crumbly, was then bound between wooden shafts, which is how we got the modern design of the pencil, it continued to call it a pencil's lead. But a pencil's lead is actually a mixture of graphite, clay, and bonding agents. The more graphite that's in the mixture, the softer and darker the line, okay? The more clay that's added to the graphite, the lighter the line, but the sharper the point and the harder the line. So obviously if you're an artist, you want a softer pencil if you want to do something that's like more expressive, right? If you're an engineer, or a draftsman, you probably want to go with a harder pencil, right? Something we can maintain finer line. Um, so as far as number two pencils are concerned, you'll notice on the shaft of most number two pencils, it says number two HB. <coughs> the number two is the American designation of the graphite. HB is the European designation. The American system is numerical. The European system has letters. Europeans go all the way from 9H, which is extremely hard, to 9B, which is extremely soft. There's a chart of all this in, uh, in my book, in the chapter, Anatomy of a Number Two Pencil. Does that answer your question? <laughs> what explains the difference in a number two pencil having two very different kinds of lines? Is it the same brand from the same box? No, different, different brands. Oh, then it's probably just an issue of like uh, two different pencil <laughs> manufacturers using either different quality graphite, different quality clay, or just having their, their ratios slightly off. You know what I mean? It's like when you buy trousers. Are you a man who wears trousers? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Little, that was, took you longer to respond than I thought. Uh, but you know how sometimes, oh, my Banana Republic 36s, and then I went to, you know, Ferragamo and bought, I don't know if Ferragamo makes pants, but and then I bought 36s from them and they were tighter because everything was a little bit different. You know what I mean? So in this world, we must learn to embrace those, those chaotic fringes that define difference among different phenomena. Does that make sense? You should read Edmund Husserl to explain it. That's the foundation of phenomenology. Okay, guys. So I'll, I'll be happy. Thanks for coming, first of all. And I'll be happy. To uh, thanks to uh, the space and thanks to uh, uh, Chop Suey for having me. And also, there's going to be a little improv comedy after this. So stick around. It'll be a fun night. Okay, bye. <laughs>